Hello, uh, welcome to Keep Your Thrive Alive. I'm Mark Mulligan, and this is the space where I share tips and techniques to boost your mood, your energy, and your well being. Today, I'm delighted to have Shan Phillips here with me. Shan is one of my closest friends. She started acting professionally at the age of 11, and she's been working ever since. She won many awards, including a BAFTA for her role as Livia in I Claudius. She was made a CBE and a DBE for services to drama. When it comes to resilience, I can't think of anybody who embodies it more. Whenever she falls down, either physically or metaphorically, she bounces back quickly. I'm delighted to introduce you to Dame Shan Phillips. Enough of the Dame now. <laughs> <laughs> For me, you personify resilience. Well, that ability mm. to fall down and get yeah. back up again. The story I love was that the rehearsals you were doing with Frantic Assembly and you physically fell down, banged your head, had a lump the size of a, <laughs> a tennis ball on the back of your head and your response was to stand back up <laughs> and do it all over again. And well, then the next morning you were there and you were uh, the first person. Well, I was fine though, but I was fine, you know, I was, I was okay. I, but I do feel it's a work in progress, you know, I'm very conscious that every day is a work in progress. <laughs> Can you tell me about a time in your life when you were really up against it, when you were actually challenged and you had a real need for resilience yourself? I was still a student at RADA and uh, in the fog, because London used to have terrible, terrible fogs in the, in the 50s, and in the fog, the car I was being driven into the theatre where I was, we were doing a matinee in the big theatre, um, collided with a lorry. And I came to um, on an operating table inside St. Mary's, Paddington. And there was a young man, I think he was a student, who was, who was swearing to himself quietly as he was putting stitches in my face. He was like, oh, you know, oh, and pulling and pushing. And I said, excuse me, what time is it? And he said something like 12 or 15. I said, I've got to go. And he said, no, you can't, I haven't finished. I said, well, could you finish quickly because I have to go. And he said, but you'll be concussed. I said, I've got to go. And I slid off the table in the end. He finished putting the stitches in. They were very nasty stitches. There were threads everywhere. And I'd broken my nose, broken my jaw. I had, my face was smashed. And um, I got, I left at Mary's, must have got a taxi covered in blood got to the theatre, the show was actually tuning up to go, it was a musical. I did the first scene which were, where I played a, a witch in the woods in the dark with green lighting, hideous, with a big black hat singing a song while she stirred a big cauldron. And then off I beetled to my dressing room and got into my beautiful ball gown with a tiara because I was going to come out of a huge wedding cake bearing a casket containing the gift of beauty for the fairy princess. Well, the doors opened, the music played, and I came out, and of course the audience collapsed with laughter because there was this hideous face covered in stitches and turning blue and yellow and green and purple and all colours. And somebody said to me, for God's sake, nobody said, what a good person you are to be here, or shouldn't you be in hospital? They said, it was very tough in those days. They said, couldn't you get something to disguise all the, all the muck on your face? And I went out and I bought a series of of bits of um, tape and sparklers and glue and covered over all these stitches. Well, I must have looked worse, actually, but I played the second show, then the evening show, and then I went home on the tube to Earl's Court, and people must have thought I was insane, but I was completely oblivious. What was going through your mind? Though? Nothing except I, I have to get to the theatre to do the show, because from childhood, I, this had been dinned into me that this was the main part of my job, that you could not not be on stage. How much time have you had off as a result of illness? Not one day, no, never. Never one day no. in that whole career? No, no. No. So what, what is the mindset? What's the mindset behind that that allows you to? I, I think it's partly what, what one was told. You know, that, that as a child, I, I started performing before I became a professional. I started when I was about four, I suppose. And even then, I remember being told, oh, come on, put yourself together, you know, you'll be all right. And that idea of your know, bendiness, what is the essence of it? What is it that, that you learned that would be useful or resourceful to other people, do you think? If you are very sure yourself of what you want to do or what you want to accomplish, 
you will set parameters for yourself that other people will not maybe do you know the the sensible thing may be to stop give up or whatever if you yourself really want to do something then without being told you will follow a certain path you know that you should listen to your own voice because it, it, it will usually tell you if it's beyond you then you can't you know if you physically cannot get up off the floor then you can't do it and that's no shame to anybody usually you can get up off the floor if you really if you really 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 want to do something because mm. you're doing it for you mm. you're not doing it for anybody else particularly so a clarity for yourself clarity about yes what i it suppose is that, you that you want to do in life and then it seeps over into everything everything you do really i think great i think so you had an incredibly long uh, successful career um and in the middle of your career, there was a time, yeah. 15 years when yeah. things were locked down for you and yeah. you weren't able to pursue your passion. No. <clears throat> Can I you tell us something about that and how it was yeah. and how you coped with that? Well, it was circumstances in my life which I accepted and, and the, those were the circumstances I had bought into, so there was nothing I could do about it. And um, I realised that I was going to maybe have to put up with not doing what I wanted to do for the first time in my life I was really trapped and I I couldn't see a way out because there was no good way out there wasn't one and I could have uh, found a way out by changing the circumstances wrecking everyone's life around me and getting on with it and I just couldn't do that at that time so I, I didn't know what to do and and things were really really difficult for me and all the sort of good things that have fallen into my lap were now being given to other people, you know, life-changing roles I was having to reject. And it, it, was, it was just, at first, unbearably difficult. They were given to people who did them brilliantly well and they became very successful. And I felt I was waning more and more and more and I lost all my friends in the business and I lost all my contacts. I just seemed to have no future. And I had to accept the fact that I might not have the future or the career that I had had. So I thought, okay, I can't, I'm going to go on doing this job regardless. So I went on doing it in a very minor, low key, under the radar way. I performed in things that I couldn't really be any good in because I didn't have, they didn't require me to be, you know, it was all very, very dim. And, um, but it kept me busy and working and practicing. And I thought that was important. I kept studying, reading, figuring out parts, going to see other people, and I realized quite early on that the only really bad thing that could happen to me was that I would become corroded, that I, which would stop me completely. I would become envious, depressed, and I thought, now that's the big danger. And I consciously re fought against that because it isn't in my nature anyway to be envious of anybody, but I really had to work hard then not to be. And I, I managed it. I, and in the end, I decided I had to leave the circumstances and, and alter my life. And fortunately, I was given second chances. I was terribly fortunate. And I was able to bounce back, but it was a long period of being not bounced back, if you know what I mean. And your career has come back and you've been very successful. It came successful back, since. it came back. I didn't think it would. I thought it was yeah. very possible that it never would. But I still wanted to do it all my yeah. life. You know, I, I didn't want to do anything else. Brilliant. And you, of all the people I know, have an incredible range of personal strategies yeah. for looking after yourself. You know, oh, when yeah. I run when I run workshops, I often <laughs> ask people uh, to think about, you know, what are the things that sabotage them or yeah. what are the things that, yeah. that help them? But mm. if you were to think about your habits and your routines, mm. what are the things that you do that, especially the things that help you? Oh, you? The, the, I, without a doubt, the, the most useful thing I learned at school, for example, was gymnastics, was physical training. It was, we had a magnificent gymnasium and a brilliant uh, gymnastic teacher and I was mad about it and um, I, that is the most, that and Latin and philosophy, those are the three things that have really helped me in my life and physical training I would put top of the list actually. 
I, I walk everywhere. I don't um, have a car and um, I use public transport, which is important because you have to run, jump, climb stairs, you know, do all those things every day, lots of it. Um, I do Pilates and I've done it for years and years and years with, with a very a tough teacher, not not a nice relaxing Pilates, but a really horrendous <laughs> Pilates. <laughs> so I, I do that. I do gyrotonics, which I love because it's fun. And latterly I've been learning um, Alexander Technique, which I didn't appreciate when I was young. It wasn't violent enough for right. me. So I, I wasn't interested in it. Now I'm fascinated by it and it has helped me so much. Wow. I, it's helping. I still don't quite understand it, but I'm, I'm loving learning it. You know. um, so, so if you look at all of these physical things, yeah. like in a typical week, yeah. like, are you doing one or two of these things or how do you? I would do of... all of them uh, probably, in, you know, in any typical week. Yeah. Yeah. What are your other strategies? Um, but I do always have new, uh, um, not obsessions, but new interests anyway. You know, like um, at the moment I'm brushing up my because I've had this terrible disappointment uh, about a job which I've got over. But I do have a, a few weeks off, which I, I find disconcerting. And um, I'm, I'm brushing up my French and my Welsh in tandem, which is kind of mind-bending. <laughs> I do a little bit every day on my phone. You know, I do a little, I've got a little app. That, so I do about 10 minutes each every day. And, and that's interesting. That's fun to do. So, yeah. so those are uh, things that you do that are helpful for you. Yes. So physical activity, learning new things. Yes. Do you have a sense of things that are sabotaging for well, you? Well, oddly enough, the same things that help you can sabotage you. Um, I, I know that I'm helped a lot by the fact that I don't think about myself too much um, because my parents, my teachers, and everybody in my community made a point of telling children that they were not important, you know, in the grand scheme of things. And would they just behave? Um, I don't think children, my children weren't brought up that way. <laughs> and um, so you're brought up not to think too much of yourself, which helps you, of course, enormously in, yeah. in situations because you're not thinking, Oh, nobody's paying attention to me. I feel miserable because I'm not sort of being looked at. I was like, who cares? You know, it doesn't really doesn't matter. Um, uh, but that can also stop you from claiming your right. Mm. And I think everybody should have a sense of self, which is I'm probably a little bit low on on that, and I have to watch it because I find it very hard to say no to things I don't want and I don't like and that's led me into difficulties in the past you know it's really not a good thing and also the, the sense that you're not i always think oh i hope i'm, I'm going to be good enough to do this is, is practically probably a good thing to think but it's also if it's too strong it can be very sabotaging because you get so nervous about what you're going to do that you don't feel free enough to mm. give it your best and, but that's something, again, you have to fight against things that you were taught sometimes when you were young. I remember you saying something to me along the lines of that you're always focused on the end game, so like yeah. the outcome, yeah. with this sort of belief that it's worthwhile going through the yeah, pain or I the difficulty because of what it is you can get yeah, at the end. Yeah, all those cliches are true, you know, no, no pain, no gain, uh, all those things. You have to expect some discomfort or pain because uh, it gets you somewhere good and you feel wonderful if you do manage it. It's just great. And if you don't manage it, it doesn't matter that much. That's the other thing that I find extremely helpful is that I'm, it is not the end of the world if I don't succeed. It is not the end of the world if I fall down. If you had the opportunity to either give yourself at a younger age some advice or somebody who is starting out in their career mm. now, what advice might you give to somebody? I, I honestly think I would be very wary in giving advice to, to anybody or to my younger self because I honestly think that all the things that happened, many of which were difficult or horrible, were things that had to happen and because I needed them to happen. And 
I, th I don't think you can budget for for getting it all right. There's no, there's there isn't a way. The the one thing I would say to people though, because I'm sort of a great age, um, is that I I must say that in the last five six years maybe seven years, I've I've really been happy in the way I was when I was a child. I feel more like that. I, I realised uh, not so long ago really that I felt now the way I felt then, which is before I sort of went into the big world. I'm in the big world and I love it, but I feel in a way I'm in another world as well. It's really nice. And what is that feeling? What's that child? I don't feeling? know. It's just a feeling of happiness. Yes. It's just being happy, you know. In, I, I can't describe it, really. <laughs> Sharon, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. And if we can take even just 1% of your spirit, well, yeah. uh, I think it'll be hugely useful to a whole host of people. And I'll be back next month with some more tips and techniques as part of Keep Your Thrive Alive. And in the meantime, be well and thrive.